Okay, I, I handed out to <clears throat> almost all of you last week this article, Is Your Modern Translation Corrupt? I wanted to start out by saying, asking if people had questions or comments about this. Did it make sense to you? Are you okay now that you, that, that you don't have to use just the King James Version? And you understand the argument in this as to why that is. Um, this, I wanted you to see this not only because the start of the book talks about translations and this question of King James, King James only came up. In fact, I actually had somebody, um, the first term of the Instituto, we had uh, Old Testament survey, Old Testament theology, and how to study the Bible. And then how, how to study the Bible, we use the, the NIV um, study Bible. And I had somebody in the class say, how can you use the NIV? I mean, it's a corrupt version, blah, blah, blah. Okay, basically, the King James only kind of argument. Um, and so I handed this out in that class too. <laughs> um, but I think, I want you to see it not only because it makes the point very rigorously and validly that the King James is not the best translation, and certainly there is no justification for saying that it in some way is is accurate when other uh, translations aren't. Very simply, the King James translators, the people who created the King James Bible in the 1600s, did not have access to the oldest, and we believe therefore the most accurate texts available, especially in the Greek. Those were not discovered until after the King James Bible was translated. And some of the accusations that are made are specifically addressed in here, but I wanted you to have this not only because of that argument, uh, so that you feel okay about if you read the New American Standard or the NIV or the English Standard Version or the Holmans or whatever your version might happen to be, uh, virtually every modern translation is done by committee and it is um, reviewed by other biblical scholars. And so with the exception of some versions like the New World Translation, not New Century, New World Translation, which is a... I would go so far as to say an intentionally corrupted version that Jehovah's Witnesses have had done in order to justify their beliefs. In other words, they have changed the wording of the Bible in order to, to represent what they wanted to say. Apart from that, and there are very relatively few of those, all modern translations could be considered legitimate and viable and usable. The only difference is they are differences in style. That's the biggest part of it. Uh, to me, the, the differences are style. Which one are you most comfortable with reading? Um, and then what other tools come with it? The NIV Study Bible is the most comprehensive study Bible ever produced. I say that in terms of it has the longest concordance, the largest dictionary, the most footnotes, etc. So uh, I use that as my Bible because all of that stuff is right there and I don't have to go somewhere else if I, have, if I want to look something up while I'm in the course of reading the Bible. But apart from that, stylistically and then in terms of other, other aids that come in the book, Almost all modern translations, I believe, could be considered basically uh, legitimate. I don't always like the translations. For instance, the NIV has come out with three different versions in the last few years. Um, they did today's New International Version, the Reader's NIV, and each one is slightly different, geared toward particular kinds of usages like in the church or as a pew Bible or whatever. And some of the translations they have done while they are textually legitimate, I don't like in, in some of those recent versions. For instance, the uh, 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, can be translated, uh, yea, though I walk through a dark valley. There's a legitimate way to translate the Hebrew to say that. It could be either one, based upon, you know, some words have multiple meanings. Well, historically, it has always been translated, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and yet they chose, in one of the, one, at least one of the recent NIVs, to translate it, yea, though I walk through the dark valley. And I'm like, darn it! You know, that's one of the most popular and most quoted texts in all Scripture. You didn't have to do that! You know, the traditional reading is legitimate as well. And I, I don't know if they just wanted to prove that some scholar who was responsible for that wanted to prove that they understood the ultimate reading or what, but, you know, I, I won't use that if I'm reading the 23rd Psalm, because that's not, people hear it, and automatically, their brains are going, wait a minute, that's not how that, and all of a sudden, they're not paying attention to anything else you're doing. Um, I had a teacher, I've said this before, a, a professor who's a friend of mine who also 
help lead our Christian fellowship group, and he would provide Bible studies from time to time. And Richard would sit down when he started to do his Bible study, and he would say, if you brought your Bibles with you, please close them and lay them aside. And listen. And he said, the reason I say that is because if I'm reading from the NIV, and actually his father-in-law was one of the chief Old Testament uh, guys working on the NIV, we actually got copies of the New Testament before they were being sold. They had some pre-printed copies, and, and those of us who knew Richard and Grace, his wife, uh, got some, some of those. Well, Richard would say, put your Bibles aside, because he said, if I'm reading from the NIV, and you happen to have the New American Standard or the King James, and I hit a verse that doesn't read the same as what you're reading, you're going to spend the next 10 minutes wondering how and why your version is different than mine, and you're not going to be paying attention. He said, it's more important that you pay attention than that you wonder about the, you know, the source you become source critics for a few minutes on what the difference in those Bibles are. So, this article deals with historical background, with how readings are determined, what constitutes corrupt, um, and then it deals with some specific alleged doctrinal corruptions, etc. Um, and so, in, in, I think that it's useful not only for the specific case it makes, but also as an analysis of the kind of critical thinking and research and documentation that modern biblical scholars go through. Um, Again, any questions about this? First Bob, and then Chris. One thing I've always wondered about is that language changes so much over time and from region to region. There's the problem of idiom and slang. How is it that we know 2,000 years later exactly what the original people meant? Well, that's why there are scholars. Um, we have not only these documents, but we have libraries full of other source documents from that period of time so that we can understand the idioms. Now, that's not to say that we have a perfect perception, and scholars sometimes disagree on that. But when you realize that there are people, you know, tens of thousands of people alive today who committed their whole life as scholars and students of this, then we can understand that as well as we can understand anything. Um, Again, that's not to say that all scholars are correct, um, but in, in some of their translations. But overall, I believe that we have great confidence that we know what it said and that we know what it meant. A lot of that's why we have a lot of different kinds of critical activities going on. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. Um, we have historical critical, the historical critical method, which looks at the history. It looks we have. Um, various aspects of literary criticism, that is, ancient literary criticism, where the whole focus is learning how the language was used, narrative criticism, how were stories told, and how is that different, and, and on and on. All these different disciplines within the larger uh, biblical, critical, and interpretive uh, discipline, uh, you know, the large umbrella, each of which deals with some aspect of that, and together they give us a very accurate understanding of that, I believe. As accurate as any understanding we have of anything else, even modern stuff because this is something people have been working very hard on for thousands of years, even before the New Testament. So, Chris? Um, yeah, the new, the, you know, we talked about the new translations. When did they actually come into being these new translations? Like in the last 50, 60, 70 years? Or? Uh, less than that. In fact, the really modern translations, I think there's a chart in your, in your book, for those of you who have read it. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I can tease him about that because I know he's insidious about doing that. Um, let me see. Well, I can I, look it up later if there's a chart. That's okay. Um, let me look and see because I can refer other people to it too. I think there was a chart that showed um, the first real translations into modern English. Um, there were some around the turn of the century, that is the start of the 20th century, but didn't go very far until really the last. You know the last 40 years of the 20th century, and that's when most of them came along. Um, yeah, and again, that's talking about modern translations. Here you go, uh, page 31. Um, the English Revised Version was 1881 to 1885. That was the first real updating after the King James Bible. So that was 250 years later. 1901, which is why I thought the start of the 20th century, the English Revised uh, or uh, version. And then the American, the, the American Standard Version was written in 1901, translated in 1901 as an American version. And then the Revised Standard Version, 1946 to 52. But then you get into 1970s, 
1971 for the New American Standard, 1979 for the New King James, New Revised Standard, 1989, etc. So you see in the last 20, 30, uh, 30 years of the 20th century, there was this explosion of new translations. Yes? And with the documents, like, like King James had XX manuscripts, these guys that say in, in, in the, you know, the, 19th, or the 20th century, do they have a lot more documents than were available? A king, under King James? Yeah. Yes. Like lots and lots. Lots and lots. And in fact, not only lots of them, but older ones, which is even more important. Right. Um, the, since King James, the Kodak, um, Codex Vaticanus was found in the Vatican archives. They got so much stuff they don't even know it's there. And they found this uh, very ancient uh, Bible. Codex Sinaiticus, found at St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai. Uh, Codex Alexandrinus, found in Alexandria. Um, there are several of the most important, oldest, and the most complete versions of the Bible. And these are from the, the 300s, 300s and 400s. Um, there was nothing anywhere close to that old available when King James was translated. And so we have more <coughs> comprehensive, you know, we have a lot more particular uh, numbers. They're more complete and they're older than King James had available to them. And they did the best they could with what they had. Terry? This is off, so I'm sorry about it. If not now, at some point, I'm curious. I know Gideon puts Bibles in, in uh, hotels and many other places. Right. Uh, I mean, I'm curious because in today's world, you always check the source of the media of things that you're consuming. So I'm wondering, I guess, uh, who are the major sources of the Bible now? And, and who makes uh, some return on publishing certain you mean versions? Who prints them? Uh, I they guess I say them? publish because the publisher okay. has the money that, you know, that that's yeah. where the money trail is. I'm yeah, well, the publishers and printers are usually the same in this. There are large organizations, um, Tyndale House Publishers, Wycliffe, who's one of the big translating bodies, they also have a publishing area uh, body. One of the biggest ones is American Bible Society. Uh, there is a British Bible Society as well. There's Euro there are European versions of this, and they're connected. But the American Bible Society produces tens of millions of Bibles every year. Um, and so the, um, the NIV is owned by Zondervan. That's yeah. correct. And so Zondervan made major publishing house. Um, they, you know, they have Zondervan family bookstores and all of that, but they are a publishing house and printer as well. And so virtually every major religious publishing house is involved in that in some way. And then you have some, you know, like American Bible Society, that's their whole thing. I mean, they, they, that's all. Zondervan is also involved in a lot of other you know, music and other kinds of Christian books and all kinds of things. But um, virtually everybody involved in any sort of media practice in the Christian world also has a Bible publishing aspect. Since the, that's so the second foundation. one or the third one you mentioned, we, we met a person back in Canada who was going to some small country in, in Asia, and he was, that's what he was doing, Wycliffe. he was translating into the local language, the, I don't yeah. know what he was translating from, but yeah, so Wycliffe it's, it's is quite interesting is the uh, best known and I think probably the most active of the Bible translators today. And it's true. Wycliffe translators, they will, they will be trained. You know, Wycliffe has their own training program. Uh, and then they will be sent to, we're at the point now that we're talking about small languages. You know, the Bible has been translated in over 2,000 languages. But there are still a lot of very small language groups that don't have anything. And so Wycliffe and others, Wycliffe being, as, as I said, the most, most well-known and, and probably most expansive, ex extensive, uh, they will send a translator into a country uh, in area. In secret in some cases. Well, and yeah, in the cases where Christianity is not, is not welcome, then that's true. And they'll go in and live among the people, and, and frequently they have to spend enough time living with the people to learn the local dialect, because it may not be a language that's in print. And so in some cases, Bible translators are the first people that are responsible for creating a written version of these spoken languages. Uh, and so it's very significant in that regard as well. And they will live with them and work with them as long as it takes. Usually they'll start with, with one book. It's either uh, the Gospel of John or sometimes the Gospel of Mark, which is shorter. That's one of the reasons for it. They'll get one book done. Then they will work on the New Testament, usually, and then the Old Testament. And so we have a lot of languages. In fact, probably half the languages for which we have translated Bibles um, we have not the whole Bible, but, but a portion of it, the New Testament, or in some cases just a book or two. 
but then they'll continue once they start, once they create the written language or figure out how to write it in that language, then they will proceed until they have the whole Bible done. Okay? Yes? Uh, are there some Bibles that have an extra five books still being published? It's more than five, actually. Okay. Um, the Apocrypha. Right. The Catholic Church still considers the Apocrypha part of the Bible. And so, as does the, uh, the Orthodox churches, Eastern Orthodoxy, Oriental Orthodoxy, the churches of the East. The Apocrypha, and, they, and the number differs depending upon whether it's Catholic or Orthodox, yeah, actually, whether it's Eastern Orthodox or Oriental Orthodox. Um, but those, those books were written during the intertestamental period between the Malachi, the last of the Old Testament prophets, and the time of Jesus. Originally, they were perceived um, when the Septuagint was translated. That's when the <coughs> Bible was translated into Greek in the third century BC, before Jesus. Um, in fact, the Septuagint, because they had access to, resource, to sources in Hebrew that we they got lost later. The Septuagint, in some cases, is the most the Greek is the most reliable uh, version of the Hebrew Bible that we have because the Septuagint is older than a lot of the other sources we have. So. When they translated it into Greek, the translators decided there are some of these books that have been written, and not all of them have been written by them, um, that are historically valuable, but they're not part of the Bible. And then when, when uh, Jerome came along um, and translated the Greek and Hebrew into the Latin Vulgate, which is the Bible that the, historically the Bible that the Catholic Church uses, the Latin Bible, um, he decided to translate those books as well, but he was very clear in saying these are not equal to the rest of the Bible. They are valuable to read as history, because it's the history of the Maccabeans, the Maccabean Revolt, and the, you know, the throwing out of the, the, the Seleucids and regaining control of the temple. The whole ha Hanukkah, you know, the lights of Hanukkah are, have to do with uh, when they reconquered Jerusalem from the Seleucids, and they retook the temple, and they purified the temple, and they lit the lamps. They didn't have enough oil for the lamps to last for the eight days that it was going to require for the ceremony, and yet God miraculously multiplied the oil so that it lasted. That's where Hanukkah, all the lights of Hanukkah come from, and the eight days of Hanukkah. So, sorry, I go off on all this stuff. Um, but the bottom line is, Jerome included those books in the Latin translation, but he called them deuterocanonical, second level canon not equal to the rest of the Bible. When the reformers came along in the 16th century, they said these books, they're never quoted in the New Testament, and virtually every other book of the Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament. They're never quoted in the Old Testament. And at the Council of Jamnia in the second, early 2nd second century, the Jews had decided those books are not part of our Bible. So the Jewish people had said these aren't part of the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh. The, the, they're ne nowhere quoted in the New Testament, so the Reformers said these aren't part of the Bible, and they took them out. Well, the Council of Trent, late in the 16th century, which was convened by the Catholic Church to oppose the Protestant Reformation, basically a response to them, it was, it was the Counter-Reformation it was called, the Council of Trent passed a whole lot of uh, decisions uh, that were uh, directly aimed against the reformers. And one of those was, well, because the Protestant reformers say that these books, which we've always valued, are not part of the Bible, we now declare that they are, that they are equal to all the rest of Scripture. So in terms of electionary readings, for instance, in Catholic Church and most Anglican churches too, the Anglican churches have retained this, they will read regularly, you know, when, the, when you go through the cycle, when you come to that time of year, they will read from First and Second Maccabees, from... Um, Bell and the Dragon, from the addition to the book of Daniel, from the 151st Psalm, um, various other books that are not considered the Bible by any Protestants. And again, which, which books get included varies between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Churches. But they are, and if you want to see them, the Jerusalem Bible was one version of the Bible that was produced that's supposed to be an ecumenical Bible uh, to be used by Catholics and Protestants, etc. And it does include the Apocrypha. That's the the way most people would see it. Yes? The Bell of the Dragon isn't there anymore. They put it in briefly and then they took it out. Well, it is an Orthodox. Uh, the Orthodox Church still maintains it. That yes. could be, because the Roman Catholic Bible I read. Yeah, not. and that's the, and they vary on which ones get included. The 150 verse Psalm is not in, in both, and I'm not, I don't remember which one it is in. But there are others as well. Um, 
first Esdras, um, well, first and second Esdras, which I think are considered like um, second and third Ezra. You know, the names the names vary too, depending upon which version of the name you're using. And so, but those books are not considered by Protestants as being part of our Bible for the reasons I gave. Any other questions about that, or any questions from your reading? I'll just sit up here and you know make stuff up for the next two hours. Okay. Yes. Uh, has, have the statistics been done on how many people are still following the uh, King James versus the other? Because I don't the, know. the Baptist church, you know, a lot of those churches are still with the... Yeah, they, a lot of churches still use it. And there, there's really, a lot of people still read from the King James. But a lot of, I'd, I'd say most of the people who read from the James do so because they love the language still. And, they, and that's the, the Bible they had as children. I mean, that's the Bible I first heard from. You heard me say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's King James. Okay, the yea part. And a lot of the scripture that I learned when I was in Bible camp, when I was a little kid, I, I don't come from a Christian family, but, you know, I went to Bible camp, it's, it was from the King James because that, that was in, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of the other translations then. Uh, because they are very recent. So, most people who read the King James read it because they, that's what they know, and they still love the language. Very, relatively few of those people are adamantly King James only. In other words, they don't read the King James on principle, or because, for theological reasons, they do it because it's what they know and what they love. Uh, but in terms of how many people are still using it, I, I have, I'm, there have been statistics, there are statistics available on everything, so I'm sure somebody's done that, but I don't know what that would be. Okay. Let's pick up, we actually have a lecture for today. Today we're talking about questions of meaning. And again, did you have, are, are you doing okay with the book? Any questions about that? Next week, I was going to show you this morning, and the speaker on, the, on this uh, laptop aren't good enough, but I'll connect some speakers to it next week, and I will play for you, I am the very model of a biblical philologist, which is a parody that's done on the powder song from Pirates of Penzance, Gilbert Sullivan, I am the very model of a modern major general. Um, it's very funny, and if you think that some of the language and stuff that you're running into in this book's bad, wait till you hear, I am the very model of a biblical philologist, and then you'll really be shocked. A philologist is a word study person. Philology is the study of words, where they come from, what they mean, how they relate to each other. Okay, so today, questions of meaning. I, I want to pick up where we fit, where we cut off last week, because I didn't finish everything. We did get into discussing inerrant and inerrancy, infallible and infallibility, and inspired and inspiration. And I need to talk a little bit more about those, because we didn't get into the next. I also talked about the neo-orthodox interpretation, etc. The, the issue of inerrancy, especially in the... 70s and 80s was the, the major battleground amongst evangelical Christians. Because inerrancy is defined as um, the belief that the, or doctrine that the Bible is completely truthful in all things that it asserts, whether geography, chronology, or theological detail. And Wayne Grudem here, um, he's the guy who wrote the book we used in systematic theology class, he said the inerrancy of scripture means that the scripture in the original manuscripts does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. There are no errors in the original manuscripts. Okay? Um, infallible or infallibility, while that means cannot, you know, cannot err, infallible means it, it can't do anything wrong, and yet it has come to mean more that the Bible is, is without error in all matters of faith and practice, or theology and faith, uh, some people say, and then inspired simply means that God, God was involved. God inspired it. But the inerrancy question, um, people fought, you know, scholarly battles, you know, not literally fisticuffs, I don't think. Uh, it may have happened somewhere. But they fought battles over, because they felt that the, the, the reliability and the authority of the Bible was being diminished by people who were picking at uh, areas like saying, well, the Bible is not, cannot be used for scientific accuracy or geographical accuracy or whatever. And in that way, we're beginning to erode the authority, the reliability, and believability of Scripture. And so the inerrantists planted their flag very firmly and said, no, the Bible is without error in anything because it is um, co-authored by God. I say co-authored because the whole concept of plenary uh, inspiration, verbal plenary inspiration, this miraculous combination that it was written, God chose human authors, and they wrote it 
with their vocabulary and their personality and everything else. They were involved, and that's why we can tell the difference of the writing of Paul from the writing of John or of Peter, because their, their style, their personhood came into it. And yet, the verbal plenary inspiration says that God, in a mysterious way, um, superintended the process so that the final what without turning them into robots or dictating every word um, God was involved to the extent that the final product was exactly what he intended and the analogy for that is the incarnation the incarnation which is you know Jesus was fully God and fully human and it is a paradox meaning it's a mystery we don't know how to actually explain that but we accept it as being true that something can be fully of God and fully human Jesus was, and so in the same way we believe that is the truth about Scripture, that God's intention is fully reflected, and it is it is God's word, and yet He worked fully through human authors in making it happen. Fully God and fully human, just like the incarnation. Okay. And so the question is, um, it really comes down to this issue of the original manuscripts. And so I want to spend time now. I began to touch on this last week. I want to spend time now talking about qualifications to inerrancy. Um, first, inerrancy, even, the, even the, the most rigid inerrantists would insist, or would agree, they might not insist, but they would agree reluctantly, that inerrancy applies only to the autographs, which means the original manuscripts written by human authors of Scripture. An autograph, when you talk about a document autograph, it means the original, just like your autograph is an original writer, okay? Um, what that means is no one denies that there are some copying errors that developed through the centuries in both Hebrew and Greek <coughs> manuscripts of the Bible. Now, we believe, as I talked about uh, two weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago, it was last week, about reliability, uh, last week, the reliability of the witnesses, that we have more evidence, more documentary evidence for the, the New Testament Old Testament as well, but the New Testament especially, than any other, by far, than any other ancient document. And for that reason, we are confident to the highest possible degree that we are able to reconstruct the original wording of the Old and New Testament with extreme accuracy. Scholars vary that saying between 96 and 99.5 percent accuracy that we have exactly the original documents. And that's because of the vast number of different documents we have to compare, that, and you know canons of textual criticism to be able to decide that. So, but no one disagrees that in the most modern manuscripts we have, that there were textures, usually unintentional, often having to do with numbers. For instance, numbers were copied uh, wrongly. So the question of inerrancy is only that the original manuscripts, the original autographs, were without error. And only, the only time errors have crept in are minor errors of copying over the centuries. It's, it's been reproduced. Um, now, this is one of the reasons why I, I have always felt, even though I was in seminary in the early 80s when this was all really going on, one of my professors, Jack Rogers, was one of the people who was most the target of the inerrantists. My, and I don't agree with everything Jack said. I'm not saying this because he was my professor. Uh, I, think, I think he went too far. But since... The argument is that only the original autographs are without error, and we don't have the original autographs, <coughs> and we can reproduce them with very, very high in, uh, accuracy. Why are we arguing about this? We're arguing about something that doesn't exist anymore. Um, I don't think we need to get quite as worked up about this. I, over the, I used to say that I insisted on the principle of infallibility, that God would not allow anything that affected our faith or the practice of our faith to be changed in any way, that God protected that. I'm leaning, you know, over the years I've leaned more toward inerrancy, that I believe the original manuscripts were inerrant, but I don't believe it's worth punching each other in the nose over this stuff, because we don't have the original manuscripts, and that caveat is always in there. Okay? Now, that's, so that's one thing. Secondly, the inerrancy respects the authorial intent of the passage and the literary conventions under which the author wrote. Some people would claim scripture isn't, um, isn't inerrant because there are, um, there are expressions in there. This sort of goes to what you were saying, Bob. Idioms, 
uh, various kinds of literary conventions that existed 2,000 years ago that we don't, we don't have today. Um, there are figurative representations. I'll give you an example, and I've used this before. It's often quoted as um, an error in Scripture or a contradiction in Scripture. In uh, Mark, the first chapter, the second and third verse, first, second and third verse, Mark cites three different Old Testament texts. Those texts are from Exodus, from Isaiah, and from Malachi. And, but then he says, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. Well, somebody who would be wanting to argue against inerrancy or wanting to claim contradictions in the Bible would say, that's a mistake, that's an error. Those texts aren't in Isaiah, they're in three other books. Well, back to this issue of uh, literary conventions and authorial intent, it was common for the Jews to refer to one book, the dominant book of a section of scripture, as, as by name, representing all of them. So Isaiah, who was, the, who was the longest and the most authoritative, by Jewish standards, of all of the prophets, often they would say, as we read in Isaiah, when what that's a that's a shorthand way, a literary convention way of saying, as we read in the prophets. Jesus does the same thing. Jesus refers to the Old Testament, and he says, as it's found in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Well, he doesn't just mean the Psalms, he means all of the wisdom writing, the third category, the wisdom writings. And Psalms, being the longest and most important of those books, often when they're talking about the wisdom writing, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, Song of Solomon, they would just call it Psalms. Jesus did that. That's a literary convention. It's not a mistake. You can't say it's not inerrant because Mark did that, Jesus did that. Make sense? So we have to be aware of those conventions. Third, it is clear that the Gospel authors are not intending to give a strict chronological account of Jesus' ministry. The material is frequently arranged topically, and this was the way they wrote. Jewish authors wrote 2,000 years ago. Instead of writing it as history, like event, 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 in chronological order, the writers of the Gospels frequently will say, this is an event and this is what happened. And over here, there was another thing where the same point was being made, the same thematic content, and they'll move it over here and, and publish it next to it. Well, because the Gospel writers had certain different kinds of emphasis, Matthew is, more, is uh, much more Jewish, you know, his focus is on the Jewish antecedents to the Christian faith, whereas Luke is a Gentile, because they had different... They, they don't tell a different story, but because they have different emphases in different places, they will order those differently. And yet you can't claim that the Bible is somehow making a mistake because the Gospel writers don't line things up exactly the same way. Um, in Luke, for instance, the temple is a major motif. So G, uh, Luke arranges Jesus' temptations, for instance, to place the pinnacle of the temple temptation. You know, the, Satan took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and said, throw yourself off and the angels will catch you. Um, he makes that the last one, whereas Matthew has a different order. Well, we have to understand the literary conventions. All of this also advocates for some of the other things we're going to talk about today, and that is to get to the accurate meaning of things. We have to know stuff. We have to study this stuff. We have to do some work. If we're going to be good biblical interpreters. And not just, you know, and, and God calls some people to do that, and some people, you know, some people to do the work and to speak what interpretation is accurate, and God calls on some people to listen. Well, if you're in this class, I'm assuming that you're part of the first group. That in some way, either for yourself or for others, you are choosing to be one of those that God would use to help interpret Scripture. Maybe for your own study, it may be for a Bible study class, it may be because you want to be involved in other kinds of ministry, but you're one of the ones that has to do the work, and not just listen to what somebody else has done. Alright? Um, yes? Do we know if Jesus ever wrote anything about his own ministry? No, he never wrote anything never wrote uh, the, well, that we're aware of. The only thing we, we have a record that he wrote off was when he, he knelt in the dirt. Yes. When the woman was brought to him in adultery, he knelt down in the dirt and wrote something, and he was writing something in the dirt with a stick, you know, kind of thing. We don't know what that was. We have no record of him ever writing anything. Okay? Um, other qualifications. Inerrancy allows for partial reporting, for paraphrasing, and for su summarizing. Um, the 
Sermon on the Mount, one of the most important sections, if Jesus were to stand up and give the Sermon on the Mount exactly as it's recorded, it would take him less than 10 minutes. And this, this is one of the major proclamation events that we have in the whole Bible, which leads us to believe that this has been summarized, that the, you know, Matthew especially, Matthew 5, that when he's recording the Sermon on the Mount, that he's only given us the high points, rather than trying to give us a transcript of everything that was said. That would likely, you know, people talked a lot longer then. Now, sermons are 20 to 30 minutes in most cases. If I go 35 minutes, somebody will complain to me about that. And I can tell you who those people would be. <laughs> I can expect it. Now, that's not true everywhere. There are a lot of ministers who will preach 45 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half, especially like in Asia. Um, the ministry there, it's customary for them to preach for a couple of hours. Well, that, that was true in the Old Testament, in the, uh, in the New Testament times. That when somebody got up to speak, and we have examples of that. Paul, it was his last night, um, he started talking, and he kept talking and kept talking and kept talking, so much so that as he was approaching midnight or whatever, one, one young man that was sitting in a window, listening to him, got so sleepy, he fell, asleep, fell out of the third story window and died. And, and Paul prays for him, and he comes back to life, and then Paul starts talking again, and keeps talking until daybreak. So we know that's the case. It is unlikely that Jesus, at this very important time, you know, the, the major focus that he has theologically in the Sermon on the Mount, only talked for ten minutes. Um, so, we understand that it's, it's paraphrased, it's summarized, um, that there is partial reporting. This is also why we have slightly different records in the different gospel writing. It's because they paraphrase things or summarize things differently from one another. They didn't copy each other. Now, there are places where it appears as though, you know, Mark and some other document were the sources for Matthew and um, Luke. We say that because there are places where Matthew and Luke are exactly the same as Mark, and there are places where Matthew and Luke are exactly the same as each other, but not to Mark, which means there probably was some other document, document which is called in, in textual criticism Q, which means Kelle, which is the German word for source, that there was some other source that appeared that they used. So we know all that. And that's the kind of analysis that gets done. But just because they summarize differently or paraphrase does not mean somebody was wrong. Okay. Okay. Yes? What would, the, what would be some of the other sources? I, I didn't understand that Q. Well, um, we believe that Matthew and John were present for the whole ministry of Jesus. So there's his first person account. Mark account is based upon Peter's first person account because Mark became secretary and assistant to Peter and his gospel is widely understood to be what he learned from Peter. And then Luke interviewed everybody, he tells us that, and then he was a companion of Paul's. And so that was his connection all along. And Luke may have been there fairly early on as a Gentile, um, seeing some of this stuff. So the thing is when we compare the actual scriptures, there is some stuff in each of the Gospels that is unique to them. That's you know, stuff in Matthew that's not in Mark, Luke, or John. Uh, and actually, synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, are very different than John. And John was written later, so we don't even really talk about them in comparison. But within Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's some stuff in each Gospel that is unique to them. There is some stuff in Matthew and Luke that are exactly verbatim to something that's found in Mark. And so the traditional, the usual, the most common interpretation, and, and there's no theological import to this, I don't think, but is that Mark was written first, and that Matthew and Luke had Mark's gospel. Now, even though you know they had other sources, and Matthew had been there himself, you know, if I'm Matthew and I sit down and I'm getting ready to write out the story of you know of Jesus, and I go, well, you know, Mark, who's with Peter, has written this stuff out. Let, let me make sure that I'm. That'll help me remember all this stuff. And then in the process, you know, he copied some phrases. He said, that's a good way to say that, and that's accurate, so I'll just copy that in. You know, I'll put that in my book. There's no negative to that. Don't, don't imagine there is. Well, the same thing with Luke. He had Mark's Gospel, and he saw some stuff in Mark, and he, you know, Luke admits that his stuff was from other people. He interviewed people, and, you know, and so he used that. So some of what is in Matthew and Luke is, is apparently copied from Mark. But then there are other parts of Matthew and Luke which are exactly verbatim 
but they're not in Mark or anywhere else. And so it's believed that since they're exactly the same, then probably there was another source that they were both looking at, somebody else who had been there, who had experienced all of this and written it all down, and that that was another source document that they used along with Mark to write their Gospels, and that's called the Caled, or Q. Why do they assume that it's not that Luke copied from Matthew? Well, um, the timing on it is such that they don't believe that Matthew's Gospel, Matthew and Luke were written close enough together. When a book is written, there are certain assumptions made about how long it takes for that to be in wide distribution. The fact that Matthew was Jewish, Luke was Gentile, you know, they, they had some overlapping circles, but the belief is that they perhaps had a common source rather than that one of them was written sufficiently earlier than the other one that it would have been in wide distribution. Sufficient distribution would have been used. It could have been. Some people question whether the, the, the Q document exists, right? But um, those are all source that's source criticism. And the problem is that some people who have gotten into that then get very cynical and skeptical about it. When in fact, I don't think you have to be either cynical or skeptical to say there are legitimate reasons why they would have done that. And that, in fact, it's, it's perhaps that God inspired them to use others, other references because he wanted to have that in that gospel as well. I don't have a problem with that. Were they still all together? What's that? Were they still all together? Oh, no, 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 no. They, they were, were all? Yeah. They were all in different places. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's believed that Mark, yeah. I, I, we'll get into all kinds of stuff. Okay, number five. Inerrancy allows for phenomenological language. That is, description of events as they are observed or experienced from one vantage point rather than providing an objective scientific explanation. There are places where we have, especially the Synoptic Gospels. Again, John is a unique case because John's a theological, it's much more theological than historically or anything. The three synoptic, which means same seeing or looking the same, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there are places where they are reporting the same thing and have different emphasis. And when they say phenomenological, the, the fact that um, they might refer to the sun rising. You know, some people really looking for critical, reason to be critical of the Bible will say, well, they refer to the sun rising, the sun doesn't actually rise, the earth rotates. Well, if, if a meteorologist says, well, sunrise tomorrow is going to be at 6.04, do you say, that guy's lying because the sun doesn't actually rise. The earth rotates, and it just makes it look like it. Really? I mean, come on. And yet that, some people have leveled criticism like that to, against the, the, the scripture because they say, well, that's not technically accurate. We allow for phenomenal, uh, phenomenological language, um, meaning from the perspective they have. Sixth, inerrancy allows the reporting of speech without endorsement of the truthfulness of that speech. For instance, Paul, when he is speaking to the philosophers in Athens on Mars Hill, the Areopagus, he <coughs> quotes Epimenides and Aratus, two Greek philosophers. That he's doing that in order to, to show that he knows the Greek writings, which, which rightfully would have impressed the, the Greek scholars because he was Jewish, but also uh, to, to be able to become all things all men, as Paul says, so that he could relate to them. That doesn't mean he agrees with what you can, you, you know, the quote of what uh, Epimenides or Aratus says. He's using that to connect with these people. It doesn't mean he's an advocate for their particular Greek philosophies. You can't blame him for that. Um, there's a passage in Psalm 14.1 that says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Well, that doesn't mean that the fool is right when he's quoted. And yet some people, these are all points that people try to accuse the Bible. Okay, make sense? And then seven, inerrancy does not mean the Bible provides definitive or exhaustive information on every topic. If you want to find out how to cook French pastry, you're not going to find it in the Bible. And yet, some people have accused the Bible and said, well, if this is the Word of God, it should be on everything. It should be Encyclopedia Britannica Plus. No, that's not what the Bible is for. And probably a good way to say this is that, you know, some of the mistakes that are made about Scripture is that people misunderstand why the Bible is, why the Bible exists. It was given to us as a record of who God is, who we are, and how we're supposed to relate to Him. Fundamentally, that's what it does. It is not a book on French pastry or ornithology or anything else. If there's any reference to birds in there, you can consider it a text on ornithology. So don't try to make it that. 
And then eight, inerrancy is not invalidated by colloquial or non-standard grammar or spelling. Some people have said because there are places where some of the writers of the, of the New Testament had wonderful Greek, you know, really excellent technical Greek. Um, some of them, their Greek is very simple. John, as beautiful as the Gospel of John is, and in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. It is beautiful. The Greek is really simple. It is the writing of somebody who's not well educated in terms of technically well educated. You know, he's not writing a scholarly paper. The book of Hebrews is perhaps the most beautiful Greek in the New Testament. Uh, some of Paul's writings is very, he's very eloquent, he uses really well polished Greek. There are places in some of the Greek in the New Testament where the, the, the if you read the Greek, it's not very good grammar. The sentence structure is not that great. And some critics have said, well, that can't be God's word because God knows better than to have bad grammar. <laughs> God worked through these writers. And, and the meaning, the words that were captured ultimately, the meaning that's behind the words that were captured are God's intention. But we can't criticize, you know, we can't uh, question the reliability of Scripture based upon the fact that there may not be perfect grammar everywhere. Yes? For some reason, that brings up the Quran to me. You've told me that um, in reading the Quran, that that the it, it's supposed to be perfect, Absolutely. Arabic, right? Yeah. yeah. And it, and yet there are errors in, in yeah. grammar in that. They are very obvious. The Quran is understood by Islam, is professed by Islam to be eternal. That it has always existed. It is the perfect word of God that existed in heaven before it was given by recitation through the angel Gabriel to Muhammad. And yet, there are some really obvious mistakes in it, which a conservative Muslim would not acknowledge. For instance, it presents in a number of places that the Trinity, the Christian Trinity, which it quietly says God can't be more than one. God can't have a son. But the Christian Trinity, according to the Quran, is God the Father, God the Son, and Mary the Mother. <clears throat> that they believe Mary is the second person of the Trinity. They don't understand the concept of the Holy Spirit. And yet, this is supposed to be perfect. In fact, that when we were in Oman, we visited the temple of the Sultan in Salalah, and we had this wonderful, cute little guy. He was very funny. Um, as we were driving along, I may have said this before, forgive me, I never remember. We were driving along, and he's pointing out things as we drive, and he says, and over there, in this big, big, sort of very industrial complex, he said, and that's our ice cream factory. No, wait, that's concrete, that's a concrete factory. <laughs> um, it was very funny. But when we got to the to the mosque of the Sultan and we go inside, he goes over and there are racks full of Quran. He pulls one out, he brings it over and says, this is the Quran. And he says, it has never been corrupted, unlike other religious writings, it has never been changed, it is the absolutely perfect eternal word of God. Well, I'm going. <laughs> there are some real misunderstandings in there about what Christianity, what other, other beliefs are, but that's what they're, they're totally Okay, any questions about that? With those understandings about what, what we have a right to expect Scripture to be, that's in effect what we're talking about, and what is unreasonable to have as expectations of inerrancy or of Scripture as a whole, how do we deal with difficult texts? First, make sure that you're interacting with the real texts and the best available translations. There is always a danger that somebody starts out with, um, with someone else's because there are scholars that will do their own translations. In fact, it's fairly common if you're reading a book of, you know, biblical exegesis or of anything, um, that the authors, if they are, if they are scholars of the original languages, they'll give you their translation. Well, make sure that it's not Jehovah's Witnesses or it's not Mormon or it's not somebody who's got an axe to grind and so therefore is translating it in a way that he wants it to say in order to have a problem with it. And also, even if he's using a valid translation, don't start with his interpretation of it, especially if it starts out really skeptical and cynical about stuff. Make sure that you're dealing with the real text, the best, best available translations, and that you're not letting somebody else bias you in that. <clears throat> Second, approach the text with trust, not as a skeptic, even though it is very valid to investigate the truthfulness of Christianity. God is not afraid of honest, fair-minded questions. 
We can, we can ask questions like, why does it say this? What does that mean? What is the source for that? Why is this different than that? In fact, no less than St. Augustine said that when he comes across a passage of Scripture that he does not understand, he doesn't assume there's something wrong with the Bible. He, he wrote and said, my assumption is, either I don't have a good translation, or I'm not reading this correctly, or there's something else wrong with me. He does not assume, right off the bat, that there's something wrong with the Bible, <coughs> that it's not God's Word or whatever. So don't, we don't start out as skeptics, even though it's fair for us to say, you know, what, what's going on here? What does this mean? What, why, why is it saying it that way? Those, if they're, if they're honest, fair-minded questions, God is not afraid of our questions. All truth is God's truth. Um, in fact, to be healthy in our understanding of Scripture, we need to be able to ask questions. Because, to, like, like any relationship, <coughs> the way a relationship with God through His Word, um, like any relationship, not being willing to ask needed questions can create problems. We need to be able to ask. Third, we need to pray about difficult texts. Again, Jesus said, if you ask, it will be open to you. If you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be open. Well, when we're, when we're reading Scripture, we should start out by praying for guidance anyway. But especially when we come across something hard, we should say, Lord, help me understand this. And, and I've done that many times. And I find it surprising how often you'll be led to some other commentary or some other text or something else that helps explain it to you. God does not desire for us to be left in the dark. He is not trying to hide things from us. And yet we believe this is all His Word. He will help guide us. Keep in mind the qualifications of an errancy when dealing with the difficult text. What I just gave you is don't expect, don't evaluate the text based upon unreasonable expectations about grammatical you know, perfection or anything else like that. There are, there are things the Scripture isn't intended to do. Seek counsel in dealing with difficult texts. That may be through good commentaries. I don't recommend you, especially those of you who are becoming scholars of biblical interpretation, I don't recommend you start with a commentary. I know people, when they're getting ready to do a Bible study or preach a sermon or whatever, the first thing they do is pull out commentaries. That's not the way to do it. Start with the scripture. Spend time you know, diagramming it, understanding what it says, understanding the context around it, Understanding other parts of Scripture and how they speak to it before you ever ask what somebody else says about it. Uh, but at some point, especially when you're having difficulties, if you have good quality, um, either sources, people you know, your pastor, another person you know that knows Scripture well, or commentaries, then use them rather than stew in your difficulty. And be willing to set aside a task for further consideration rather than force harmonization, force it to fit into what you expect. Again, this is what um, the this is what Augustine said. In fact, I'll read you the quote. He said, I have learned to yield this respect and honor only to the canonical books of Scripture. Of these alone do I most firmly believe that the authors were completely free from error, inerrancy. And if, these, if in these writings I am perplexed by anything that appears to me opposed to truth, I do not hesitate to suppose that either the manuscript is faulty or the translator has not caught the meaning of what was said or I myself have failed to understand it. You know, and, and Augustine said, set it aside. Consider other scriptures. Consider other options. And ask the Lord for guidance. And you come back to it, then God will help you understand. Any questions about any of that? Okay, remember, we started out with our mandate from Scripture is do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Emphasis on correctly. To say correctly handles the word of truth means to find the right meaning. That's what that means. It's means, meaning. Um, I gave you these two things earlier as well. The, the definition I gave you for biblical interpretation, the process of finding the purpose meaning and right application of a passage in Scripture through the study of the cultural, geographic, and historical context of the original writing, writers and audiences, literary genre and forms, textual sources and variants, language structure, word meanings and grammar, and theological harmony within Scripture. I, I myself, took a lot of different pieces and put it together in that definition for you. And I know it's a very long definition, but it covers all the bits of it. 
And then Robert L. Plummer, whose book, 40 Questions, um, I've been using a lot, 40 Questions about Biblical Interpretation, he says, to interpret a document is, by definition, to uh, express its meaning through speaking or writing, to engage in interpretation assumes that there is, in fact, a proper and an improper meaning of the text, and that care must be taken not to misrepresent the meaning. When dealing with scripture, to properly interpret a text is to faithfully convey the inspired human author's meaning of the text while not neglecting the divine intent. You see how many times meaning is referred to there. Now, the class today is about meaning, how we find the right meaning. But there are some questions that we need to ask ourselves before we even get to that. And that is, where does meaning in scripture happen? Is it in the author's intention, as Plummer seems to indicate? Plummer's coming from a historical critical perspective, which we'll talk about. Is the meaning in the text itself? Is it in the reader's interpretation? Depending upon how you answer those questions, you would become a student of one or another different kind of approaches to biblical interpretation. Is it what the original author intended? Is that where the meaning is found? Is it actually in, inherent in the text, apart from what was where it started or where it ended up? Is there something in that word? Or is it entirely in how it gets interpreted by you or whoever ever else is reading it? Each of those represents different schools or approaches to biblical interpretation. Now, I'll tell you up front, I don't think it's any one of those. I think it's all of them, and that's why this is a balancing process. But that has not, what I just said has not often been agreed with by biblical scholars. More and more today, they're coming to that agreement, uh, that sense that it's not one or the other. Secondly, is meaning limited to the author's intent? Is there meaning beyond the perception and intention of the human authors? What part does God play in this? If he superintended that. And how do we perceive the meaning God intended, not just what the authors intended? Fair? Who or what arbitrates a correct reading, or at least what constitutes a helpful or harmful reading? Who says what's right and wrong? What authority do I have to sit up here and tell you that the Jehovah's Witnesses' New World Translation is not a valid scripture, that it is corrupt? Any more than the King James only people say that the NIV is corrupt. Who gets to decide? How do you decide? Any comments about that? Bob? Well, I'm just thinking that <clears throat> this probably doesn't happen to any of you all. But whenever I well, you are German, but go ahead. <laughs> Whenever I say something, then my wife will tell me interpret what I meant when I said what I said. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say, what? Yeah. Did you get that? Yeah. I, I once had the experience similar to that, although not much with my wife. I was living, my roommate and I were living in an apartment that was part of a larger community of people. Uh, that, that was an intentional community. Not, there were a number, several Christians in the group, they weren't all Christian, it wasn't a Christian community. But um, there was one woman there who was huge into pop psychology. And so the group would sit around and they would be talking about directions for the community and whether we're going to <coughs> sell these the property or whether we're going to paint something or whatever. And somebody would say something and this woman would say, well, what I hear you saying is, and then she would say what she wanted them to say, not what they had said. <laughs> and I would sit there and listen to that and go, what? Where in the world did you get that from what she just said? And I was the only one that would challenge her on this stuff. And yet, that's exactly what some interpreters do. Okay, I'm not accusing Becky of that. <laughs> uh, but sometimes people do that. And what they're doing is they have their own agenda. They have their own, their, what they want it to mean. And so, they'll look at Scripture and say, well, what I think this is saying is, and that may not be at all what it's saying. And it's not necessarily their intention to to misinterpret it. It right. really is kind of a filter yeah. that, that's unconscious. It's true. For some people, it wasn't. For her, it was. It was malicious. She wanted to get her own way. <laughs> and some people do. Yeah. Some people are intent on getting their own way, and they do that as a, as a manipulation. Yeah. 
But for some people it is that, you know, they, they really don't see their own blindness. And what none of us do. None yeah. of us see our own biases. If we did, we wouldn't have them. Um, but who, now, and I, I'll give you sort of an answer to that. Is, you know, Marvin? Oh, it's just, I'm thinking about uh, food uh, chefs and wine purists and so on. And, and sometimes we can get into that same kind of thing. Well, this is a little better than that, or this is a little more correct, or this is, you know, and, and it's really so insignificant, <laughs> so much of it. He's been at wine tasting for us. Hey. <laughs> so everybody has, has a little different interpretation, you know, yeah. the differences are so minor. It's yeah. still wine. It's and yet they make food. a big deal of, of, of yeah. that. Now, with wine, that's... Uh, yeah, well, it's 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 yeah. 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 Um, I would say, and I'll give, I'm giving you sort of answers on this, uh, on number one, where does meaning happen? In the author, in the text, in the interpretation, I believe it's all three. And I believe communication, actually. And I started out this class talking a little bit about communication theory, which is my undergraduate degree is in communication theory. Um, and they talk about the, the transmitter, the, the text content or the content of the message, the uh, medium by which it's transmitted, which affects it, the interference, which can come from any number of things, and then the receiver. Well, when you talk about the effective communication of that message, all of those things are factors. In the same way, I believe when we talk about the meaning of Scripture as it has come to us, the author's intent, the content of the text itself, the reader's interpretation, plus some other elements we could add, interference that may have occurred, and for instance, um, textual, the textual critics would say that those minor errors that were made, they affect, that's interference, that's something that we have to deal with in order to make sure we have the best message. So I think it's all of those. Is meaning limited to the author's intent? We believe that God has an intent. Who or what arbitrates a correct reading? Well, today, um, every translation of the Bible, with the one exception I can think of, which is the message, um, Eugene Peterson, which is why Eugene Peterson would say he doesn't recommend his be the only Bible he used. Churches that have that as their pew Bible, I think, are making a mistake. I think he would agree. Um, that was a translation, and it is a translation. I used to call it a paraphrase, and I was wrong. He actually went, he's a biblical scholar, he went back to the original text, but he, he translates them in, a, in a, an exuberant way, okay, that is very meaningful to people. But, apart from the message, virtually every other modern translation has been the product of, a, of committees of scholars that sort of balance each other out and work through disagreements about how it, you know, what that word means and how it should be used and what is the idiom and how ought that to happen. People with expertise in various ancient languages and very ancient, various ancient cultures, etc. All of these kind of people. And then that stuff is, is jury reviewed quite often by people who are outside those communities. So when we talk about who gets to decide, there's a large body. Now, there are evangelical groups who would take the word of God more seriously and believe it is the word of God who would be much more rigorous in being, you know, in, in reflecting a, a divine biblical intent versus more liberal scholars. And so you do have some difference there. But it's not all done in a vacuum anymore. What is the role of theology in biblical interpretation? Do you understand that question? Theology would be not what the Bible says, but what are our larger understandings about God, which ideally have come from biblical theology, uh, from a biblical interpretation, but how does that then play back into it? What's the relationship between systematic theology, which starts with, here's what we believe about God, here's what we believe about Jesus, about, you know, etc., the church, how does that then feed back into biblical interpretation? How do they interact with one another? And it is a dynamic interaction. What other disciplines should be used to provide greater clarity? Philosophy, history, literary studies? Semantics, semiotics, etc., etc., etc. How far do you go in order to say, I have a valid foundation of understanding in these various disciplines in order to be able to accurately interpret this? Is there a limit to that? <laughs> you may be thinking, well, there's a limit. How far I will go? Uh, let's take a break. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so these questions, like question number one especially, where does meaning happen in the author's intent and the text itself and the reader's interpretation? I want to now give you the four loci of biblical interpretation. Loci is the plural of um, locus, which means the place. The four places, or um, uh, we could say foci as well, the focuses of biblical interpretation related to that. The world, ex world or world external to the biblical text. This means the context. Either the context when it was written, the God, whoever wrote it, whoever was getting the written document, or the world we have today. Okay, it can be either of those, all of those in context. What your book talks about, the village they lived in and the town we live in. Those are the worlds external to the biblical text. The biblical text itself, there is some inherent... Um, interpretation to be done with with the words, you know, word studies, the philology thing. You know, what does the word mean? I am a modern biblical, I am a biblical philologist. Um, the authors of the text, who were they? What was their context? What was their, um, what were they trying to communicate? What were their priorities? What were their, the environments from which they were working? And then the current readers, us today, um, all of these are pieces, and what, what I'm doing is I'm taking those larger things as where does meaning occur, and I'm beginning to try to sort of bring it down to recognize there are different aspects or locations that we need to be aware of, just like the book talks about their town, our town, the river that separates us, which is the river of time, and of different understandings, and then the principles that bridge that. Okay. This is another way of understanding that. Now, I'm going to do two other things. Related to this, there are three primary general approaches to biblical interpretation. And then I'm going to give you five specific approaches, disciplines. The first general approach is called the diachronic approach. That literally means across time. This uh, approach focuses on the origin and the development of the text. It especially is concerned with when the book was written what was the context then? And then, how has that come down to us since then? It's sort of the long view. It looks at the whole history. In fact, this is one way to describe what is often called the historical critical method. Critical, in these terms, does not mean negative. You can have a positive critical approach as well. And critical, in, in these technical uses, means analysis. So it's the historical analytic method would be another way to understand that. Um, so the diachronic approach looks across all of time from the writing of the text and how it's come down to us. There are several sub-disciplines to this diachronic approach. For instance, textual criticism we've talked about. That's the effort to understand the original wording of the text. How do we know we've got the most accurate text, most accurate to the original writing? That's textual criticism. Historical linguistics. Bob, this gets to the question you had. This is the question to understand words, idioms, grammatical forms, and the relationship between those, especially in the original writing. There are idioms that were used in the writing of Scripture, just like we have idioms today. I mentioned before, Guillermo and I had breakfast once a week, and it seemed like on a regular basis, my English with broken Spanish and his Spanish with broken English one of the other of us will use an idiom, and the other one will go, what? And we're always having to explain what an idiom, what, what the particular idiom means. An idiom, of course, is, is words that don't mean literally what they say, but they mean something else. You know, um, yeah. Run to the office. What's that? Run, run to, run to the, the office. office, exactly. You know, uh, I'm not going to run to the office. It just means I'm gonna, I need to get there quick. All right. Um, Form criticism, which is the effort to understand the original type of oral or written tradition reflected in the text. Tradition criticism, what were the traditions of the people and the time in which it was written and how does that affect what, how it got uh, written. Source criticism, what were the original written sources of the text. I mentioned what's called the synoptic problem earlier, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. How did they depend on each other as sources? Were there other sources that they looked to, that they drew from, which appears to be the case, that there was another document called Q. Um, so where was the source for this stuff? Redaction criticism, which is perceived ways in which the final author of the text adopted and, and adapted various sources. How did Matthew make the decisions of what he was going to use from Mark or from Q or from something else? And how did that all come together? That's redaction criticism. <coughs> 
historical criticism, the uh, review of the events that surrounded the production of the text itself, and the events narrated by the text. See, whenever you look at a text of scripture, there's at least, you know, particularly if it's one of the historical texts, when did the thing happen that they were writing about? When did they write it? When you talk about the date of, of the text of scripture, are you talking about when the thing happened or when they wrote about it? Because that's different. It's often not the same. Um, now, some critics of the diachronic method want to keep the historical uh, suppositions of this approach, but they want to get rid of some of the some of the problems that are, that have uh, accrued to this approach over the years. For instance, because it's the historical critical method, this is actually, while it's it's been the most common approach in the 20th century, and a lot of evangelical scholars, biblical <coughs> scholars, bless you, um, still, you know, this is still the, the primary focus they take, although people are open to other things as well. This is the kind of theology that was became the most the biggest problem with the liberal interpretations of the mid 20th century. Okay. Some late 19th, but 20th century. For instance, Rudolf Bultmann, who is the most famous and most influential New Testament scholar of the 20th century, and I want to find a quote I've got here. Um, he said that because it's historical critical, then history inherently cannot include uh, miraculous events because history has to do with recordable actual stuff and it can't be a miracle, it can't be supernatural. And so Boltmann went through this whole process of denying what he called demythologizing um, and taking out any reference to the supernatural. And he's the most influential New Testament critic of the 20th century. He wrote, um, the historical method includes the presupposition that history is a unity in the sense of a closed continuum of effects in which individual events are connected by a succession of cause and effect. I don't think we have a problem with that. History, sequence of events, cause and effect, it's all good. But he goes on. This closedness, meaning a closed continuum, it's a regular predictable continuum, this closedness means that the continuum of historical happenings cannot be rent by the interference of supernatural transcendent powers, and that therefore there is not miracle in the sense of the word. Such a miracle would be an event whose cause did not lie within history. So by following a radical version of the historical critical method, Bultmann and others, because he was the most influential New Testament critic of the 20th century, they pursued a complete denial of anything supernatural in the Bible. Jesus could not have raised the dead, he could not have walked on water, he did not turn water into wine, he did not feed the 5,000 with loaves and fishes, he was not resurrected. That couldn't happen, because that violates the very definition of what we understand to be history. Boltman was wrong, and scholars today have sort of awakened to the fact he was wrong, but in his day, nobody had more influence than him. So the historical critical method the diachronic approach, while it is certainly valid if put in the right context, it has been the source of a lot of real problems in terms of liberal, non-evangelical, non non-Bible respecting kinds of approaches to interpretation. You understand that? The second approach is called the synchronic approach. The synchronic approach means literally same time or within time. Whereas the diachronic approach looks at from the writing of the document, well, even the source of the writing of the document, all the way through, and how it's come to us, and all that's happened in the context, on uh, everything else, the synchronic approach focuses on one time. Usually that is, what does the scripture mean as it stands before us today as a whole? They don't really care the history, they don't care how it got to be what it is, they're not really concerned about the context in ancient times. Now, some synchronic um, theologians or synchronic interpreters would focus on the text in relation to, to the one time in which it was written, or today, as we've got it now, as the whole of Scripture, you know, what does it say to us? What's the context that we have in it today? But they don't look at that, you know, scope. They just pick one period of time and they plant their flag there and they say, that's what we're going to focus on. 
Now, they often uh, will use literary criticism, narrative criticism, rhetorical criticism, lexical, grammatical, syntactical analysis. In other words, they're not concerned about the history. You notice there's no word history in any of that. They're dealing with what does the word mean today? Or, separately, what did it mean back then? But they don't, they don't try to link those two. Uh, they look at uh, social scientific criticism, meaning uh, what's the social impact of this? So the synchronic method deals with one period of time, either when it was first written or how it exists today and what the meaning is. Diachronic tries to look at the whole range across all the time. And those, we're going to look at some specific versions of that. Then a third approach is the existential approach. The first two, actually, those names are what's used, diachronic and synchronic. Existential approach, there's no one name for this, but it basically focuses on the text, not from a historical point of view, not as a text itself, but rather as something uh, that in which we should be engaged, as a means to an end rather than an end itself. It's as though they're saying the text itself doesn't matter, but what does it do to you? How do you experience it? How does it change your life? That's much more the emphasis. The goal is an encounter with a reality beyond the text, but to which the text bears witness. That goal may be a desire to meet God, or it may be a desire to have, to apply this to your particular community of faith. How do you use it in worship and in, you know, in, in uh, spiritual growth? The existential approach, and there are very valid parts of that. You know, there's the, the canonical approach falls into this, and the canonical uh, criticism approach looks at the context of the Bible as a whole. The idea that the Bible cannot be broken up, that you can only read the Old Testament in light of what the New Testament says, you can only read the New Testament in light of what the Old Testament says, etc. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And some of these things are very valid, very evangelical, you know, really good. But this has also been the approach that has led to biblical interpretive approaches, um, liberation theology, feminist theology, black theology interpretations, homosexual uh, biblical interpretation, various other kinds of agenda-driven things, given, a, given whatever the existential, and that existential means um, to, to, ex to experience, you know, uh, existentialism is how does it affect you? What's happening to you when you go through this? And so it has, it has been very valid in some ways, uh, and very helpful, but in other ways it has created some difficulties. In fact, existential uh, exegesis, or biblical interpretation, the existential approach often is thought of in terms of two, the two basic types. One it are the types of existential um, approach that take a fundamental trust in and consent to the text. They start out with the assumption that the text is right and good and positive and interpret it. And then there are some versions of existentialism uh, here that start out with a negative interpretation of the text. They start out with ideological criticism, uh, advocacy criticism, um, etc. They look at it and say, I'm, they start out an adversarial attitude toward the text. And apply that in an existential kind of analysis for biblical interpretation. Those are kind of the two broad ones. Questions about any of those three? Again, I'm, I'm sort of trying to bring it into more specifics in, in terms of how this stuff gets done. All right, let's talk about five specific approaches to biblical interpretation. All of them are related to the other questions about where does the meaning lie? Or lie where, where do we find the meaning? Is it diachronic? Do we look at all of history? Do we look at one time in history, synchronic? Or is it entirely how it affects us, the existential? that history and those kinds of things don't really matter. Um, the first the, that's existed longest and has been both the most positive from an evangelical point of view and the most negative from a liberal German theological point of view, both one was a German, sorry. Uh, I was have to tease Bob about that. Um, the historical critical grammatical approach, and recently they've sort of added the grammatical to the historical critical. It focuses on the historical context and development of the writing, There's, and it's diachronic, therefore, the development over history, as well as an emphasis on analyzing the grammar of the biblical text. So they focus on the meanings of the specific words, as well as how the text has developed. Um, this particular kind of approach, as I say, has been the most common over the 20th century. It is still the most common amongst uh, scholars of all stripes, be liberal or evangelical. Bultmann was the one 
who developed a negative anti-supernatural kind of school within this, and then he had many followers from that. But this, um, <clears throat> this idea really is focused on the context. What was the context for the writers? What was the context for the recipients? And that context involves the historical, cultural context they were in, but also the grammatical. You know, what, what is the context for the words? What did the words mean? And then, what is our context today? And how do those particular words get translated into something that's meaningful for us in our cultural context? So that's why historical, obviously critical, which is, means to analyze that, and then grammatical approach. Um, as I say, this has been both the most, the, probably the most positive and also the most negative of approaches over the year, depending upon whether they assumed anti-supernaturalism like Bultmann did. Okay? Stop me if you have any questions about these as we go along. That makes sense? The second version, which is much newer, is called um, the um, actually I skipped my pages here. Is called the literary postmodern approach. And don't be too upset about the postmodern part. I mean, a lot of people postmodern. There have been a lot of postmodern philosophers, um, Jacques Derrida and others, who have practically destroyed the world um, and everything that's beautiful in it. But that doesn't mean that all postmodernism is a bad idea. In fact, modernism was actually the time, modernism was the time when we got so confident of our own intellectual abilities and our own reason, that's when a lot, you know, Bultmann was a modernist in that regard. The idea that our reason is, has become so great that we rely on that above all else, and that's led us in a lot of wrong, wrong directions. One of the aspects of postmodernism, for whatever negative it has aesthetically, is postmodernism has sort of decided that didn't work and has gotten us out of that. And so when we talk about a literary postmodern approach, it is looking at the text of scripture using a lot of the, the same kind of disciplines that are used in literature. Um, they'll concentrate on the linguistic, stylistic, and structural, thematic elements of scripture and use that as a focus. But it's postmodern in the sense that it's using a very uh, postmodern interpretation of those things, which gets us out of that structuralism, uh, a lot of the very negative, anti-supernatural, a lot of the problematic things that came out of uh, Protestant theology in the end of the 19th and <coughs> the 20th century. In other words, it's willing to let the, the word speak for itself instead of trying to assume that, oh, that can't be true because there's no such thing as miracles. The kind of things that happen in the modern days. So in one regard, it's very open, looking at scripture's literature, but looking at it with a little more modest, postmodern kind of approach. Okay? And the big focus there, whereas historical critical grammatical approach is diachronic. It looks at the whole history. The literary postmodern <coughs> approach is specifically synchronic, and its focus is how is it today? How is scripture today? How is it to be viewed as literature today? That takes into account genre and structure and all kinds of things that are literary criticism issues. But how is it relevant for today's reader? And in that regard, it is one of the purest synchronic. It's only concerned about this time, not about the scope of time, like diachronics, like historical critical. Make sense? Um, the third is the redemptive historical approach. This basically follows the theological interpretation of the reformers, uh, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Zwingli, and some of the others. Calvin being the most published, you know, he, he did more theology in terms of written theology than any of the others. But the reformers argued, and Calvin being one of the primary ones, that we have to look at all of scripture in terms of the role that the redemptive um, work of Christ had as central to all of scripture. That it is the redemptive act of Jesus that is the key to understanding all of Scripture and to interpreting all of Scripture. Even the Old Testament. That everything that is in the Old Testament is seen as a precursor to the redemption of Jesus. And everything in the New Testament is seen as the context for that. And nothing can be interpreted in all any of Scripture, Old or New Testament, without an emphasis and focus on that redemptive act of Christ. Now... Um, most evangelicals would say yes. In fact, um, Norman Geisler, one of, the, one of the, the biblical scholars today who 
is an apologist. I mean, uh, I use a lot of his materials when I'm preparing lectures for tomorrow's class, the apologetics class. And he actually, his Old Testament, he did an Old Testament text. Uh, the title of it is something like, you know, studying the Old Testament in light of Christ. And so he took a very vivid approach to this. Even the title of his book relates to that. And so, and I didn't use his book because I'm of the opinion that while I believe it's true that Jesus is the central message and core of all of Scripture, and it all has to be understood in light of the redemptive death of Christ, we also need to understand the Old Testament in terms of the people it was written for back then. And I think sometimes the danger of this one is that we, we don't give enough credit to the fact that God was, was using the Old Testament writings, for instance, to help direct and guide and, and correct the Old Testament Jewish people before Jesus got here. And that not everything can be interpreted only as pointing toward the redemptive act of Christ. Whereas strict redemptive historical um, interpreters would say that it all has to be seen that way. Now, I think this is very positive. It's very powerful. I don't think any evangelical could disagree with it. The only issue is how far do you push that? And that's the question I would have about it. Um, it's also true that the redemptive historical approach uh, is one of the places where we get into debate about how systematic theology and biblical theology relate to each other. Biblical theology is what does the scripture say and what does it mean, you know, as you read it. Systematic theology is the larger sense of what are the doctrines we believe, what are the truths that we believe. Now, systematic theology comes out of biblical theology, but then some people would claim that redemptive historical approach is systematic theology, that we believe that Jesus was the Christ who redeems all people, that's a systematic theological doctrine. Now it's taken out of scripture, but when you take that and you then apply that back on all of the Bible, are you doing a disservice to the biblical theology in order to emphasize a systematic theology principle, and that is that Jesus was the redemptive Savior. Do you see that? And that's what I mean when I say, I think that while the Old Testament does point to Jesus, we need to be careful that we, we don't try to force the idea of redemptive focus uh, of the Christ figure on all of the Old Testament, for instance. Because there's some ways in which God used that in the Old Testament times, without necessary reference to Jesus. Okay. So there's a balance in there, and that's one of the reasons that was argued about, even though evangelicals would have to say, yes, Jesus is the central figure in all of the Bible, and his redemption is the point to which all of Scripture is leading up to, you know, before that, and that it refers back to after that. Comments? Questions? The fourth, which I've mentioned slightly before, is the whole canon interpretive approach, the idea that the only way to validly interpret any piece of scripture is by dealing with it in terms of the context of the whole canon. The canon, of course, is the divinely inspired and approved text of all of scripture. Uh, all, of the, <coughs> all of the biblical documents that God has given to us and is recognized as that. That it's not possible to read the New Testament without a full context of the Old Testament. It's impossible to read the Old Testament without a full understanding and context of the New Testament, and it's impossible to read any passage without having a basic understanding. This is a lot of work. To really do canonical interpretation well, you have got to be a real Bible scholar. Because the only way that you can read any passage of Scripture with a full interpretive approach that takes into account all of canon is you've got to know all of canon. This also is particularly used in... Um, in Ecclesiastical. You know, the people who advocate whole canon approaches are often churchmen or women. People who the primary focus is um, a role in the church rather than in Christian academic circles. You know, it's less professors than it is ministers, priests, pastors. Because this ends up being reflecting very heavily on liturgical kinds of questions. Right? How we use scripture and respect all of canon as we use it in liturgy. That's just how that's developed. I don't know that there's a necessity for that, but that's how it's happened. Most of the people that advocate whole canon, critical approaches, interpretive approaches, are church people, people who are involved in the actual ministry of the church and not seminaries and universities. Okay? That's probably an exaggeration, but that's my experience of it. 
And finally, the fifth approach is the philosophical theological approach. This addresses the questions of biblical hermeneutics and interpretation through the insights of scholars who are primarily philosophical in their understanding. Um, it is to think, whereas um, some of the others would focus on, you know, the, like I said, redemptive historical is a challenge between biblical theology and systematic theology. The philosophical theological is, is really a, a, a balance between biblical theology and philosophical theology. Different, uh, dealing with philosophical principles. What is the nature of God? What is the nature of goodness? You know, what is the purpose of human life? Those, the metaphysical questions and other kinds of How do we know things? Epistemology, etc. Applying that as an interpretive approach. Um, the apologetics class tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about uh, philosophical apologetics is going to be one of our primary uh, focuses and distinctions or uh, discussions. So, um, questions about any of those? Yes. Um, what's the difference between canon and the scripture? Well, um, canon is the technical word, which means all of the books that have been accepted as divinely inspired. Scripture is what we have. So, in, in one way, they're the same word. Canon just has the technical meaning that it is divinely inspired, whereas scripture, somebody could call it the scripture if they thought somebody just made it up. Whereas canon has built into that word the definition that it is all divinely inspired. Make sense? Okay. Now, traditionally, scholars picked one of these, and they were one or the other of these things. They either were historical, critical, grammatical, which means they took a diachronic approach. They were a literary postmodern, which means they took a syncretic approach in terms of what it means now. They were redemptive historical approach, which means they took kind of a systematic theological approach about the redemptive, redemptive role of Jesus, and they applied that back to Scripture to interpret. The whole canon interpretive approach, which is much more church-oriented and looks at all of the Bible as the source of interpretation, which we believe is true. Scripture is the best interpretation of Scripture. Or the philosophical, which looked at the philosophical understanding approaches and the work of the great philosophers, and applied that back onto scripture in order to interpret it. Today, there is more and more of a movement, which I roundly approve of, that it's all of these, that each of them may have some uh, problems that you want to avoid. The historical critical method, if pushed too far, you get Boltmann, in which history doesn't allow for the supernatural. The literary postmodern approach is if you're focused entirely on what it means to me, then you lose the context from the past. The redemptive historical approach, if you force the redemptive role of Christ on all of the Old Testament, for instance, I think you're doing a disservice to some of what the Old Testament is about. Um, the whole canon interpretive approach is a huge requirement. The expectation of that, for most people, is not practical. If most people couldn't get there without an eternity to work on it, as Pat has said earlier. Uh, and the philosophical approach, many of the philosophers that have become primaries in that are not particularly evangelical. And so you end up perhaps being more philosoph philosophical. In fact, there's a really good book um, called Biblical Interpretation, Five Approaches, in which they take five scholars, all of them quite conservative biblical scholars, that represents each one of these. And they, and they present their views of interpretation, and then they ask each of them to interpret one passage of Scripture, the same passage. And then each of them, later in the book, have Craig Blomberg is the editor of this. Um, later on in the book, each of them is given the opportunity to respond to the other four writers. And so you have that as the second section. And at the end, they do sort of a summary of everything. And I think... Each of these writers, in one way or another, comes back around and says, well, I disagree with these little things, but basically, they're on the right track. And I think the conclusion is that all five of these approaches have something very important to offer. It's not just one approach anymore. They all have inherent dangers, but it, they all have very important disciplines that we need to be aware of and be able to apply. Okay. Now, all of this stuff I'm talking about today is fairly academic. <coughs> Right? This is not how to study the Bible class. This is biblical interpretation. And you need to understand how it's being done. You know, it's my, it's my definition of this class. And so that's why we're talking about all of that. But what do you do to apply this to your own study? I mean, understanding all of these things. And, and I recommend that, that Lombard book because it's very readable. It's very easy to understand. It's written for a lay audience. 
but it gives you an understanding of how each of these applies. Oh, the thing I was going to say is the philosophical theological approach, the other writers, some of the other writers recognize that he's the only one who really does hermeneutics. All the rest of them are doing exegesis. Remember we started this class, I told you that exegesis and hermeneutics mean two different things, but that they often are used interchangeably, the words, and they've sort of gotten confused. Exegesis means, how, do I, how can I get what the word says, hermeneutics is, how do I know what it means? Well, the guy who did the philosophical theological approach, he did not do an exegetical analysis of the passage of scripture that everybody else did. He said, "What? Uh, that's exegesis. You asked me to do a hermeneutical thing. And the others, at least the first guy who did the historical ripple, he said he's absolutely right. He's the only one who really did hermeneutics. The rest of us are doing exegesis. According to the traditional German definition of that. So there's a credit to the Germans. They differentiated exegesis and hermeneutics. Um, but so the, the, the philosophical theological approach the, uh, is is more difficult to apply that to specific texts of scripture, it's much more big issues. And this book demonstrates that. It also demonstrates clearly what the differences are in exegesis and hermeneutics and how even the guys who are doing it confuse the two. And not, you know, not necessarily negatively. I mean, it's valid to, to take the approach that they took. Alright, so well, what do you do with it? How do you use this? Well, I'm going to give you eight rules for finding meaning in biblical interpretation. Now, this would be true if you're doing scholarly work or if you're doing your own stuff. First, the rule of dependence on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inspired the writing of Scripture, and the Holy Spirit, one of its responsibilities is to interpret it for us, to teach us. And so, the fact is that the human mind has been darkened by sin. Even if we are saved, we are still broken creatures. And the illumination of God's Word, the understanding to be had in it, is only given to us by God, by the Holy Spirit, and we have to be prepared to defend, depend on Him for that. It's also true that um, the Holy Spirit will not guide us into interpretations that contradict each other or have logical or internal inconsistencies. Um, it will not cause us to try to read into Scripture some doctrine or some meaning which is not already contained in Scripture. And so the Holy Spirit not only will, will take us in the right direction, but it will keep us from the wrong direction. And so for us, as evangelical, biblical Christians, dependence on the Holy Spirit is the thing that will both give us the right answers and keep us from the wrong answers, and so therefore that's where we start. Okay? The second is the rule of historical context. And by the way, in these eight points, you're going to see bits and pieces of all the stuff I've said up till now. Historical context means we have to have an awareness of the life and society of the times in which the Scripture is written, both the people who wrote it and the people who received it. And we have to understand how that's both different and similar to the historical context we find ourselves in. We have to understand. Now, we, we said earlier that the idea of verbal plenary inspiration, uh, the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit inspired those writers so that the product was exactly what he wanted. But the human beings writing it were given their personalities and their freedom. And this is the miraculous superintending of God on the human writing, so that it was what he wanted. Well, part of it is, since the human writing had a historical context, understanding the historical context under helps us understand what the human part, where they were coming from. And as we said last week, I think, um, at the very least, Scripture cannot mean less than what was the intention of the human authors. It may mean more, but it can't mean less. So that's a good place to start. Fair? Oh, that's interesting. <coughs> These things bounce around. Um, I'll leave them both up there. Third, the rule of genre judgment. Every part of scripture is a particular genre. There are the first five books, which are sort of history, you know, history and theology, the Pentateuch. Then we have historical books, we have poetic books, we have prophetical books, some of which are more historical and some of which are more uh, theological. In the New Testament, we have the Gospels, which are kind of a history of Jesus, the Acts, which is historic, the Epistles, which are letters to specific churches and their problems. We have the prophetic book of Revelation, all of those different genres. We cannot read a poetic book with the same expectation or application of, of understanding that we read a historical book. 
You know, if we look at the book of Psalms and we try to apply the same kind of expectations to that that we have of Joshua, a historical book, it's going to be very confusing. And so we do have to make judgments about what is the genre and what, is it, what should we expect from it, or we will get confused. This is where some of the literary critical stuff comes into. The literary postmodern, they deal a lot with genre and with style of writing as being important, and it is. Now, a lot of the stuff you're going to do naturally. I mean, when, it would take somebody who was pretty, a pretty much a newbie to Scripture to read Psalms and read Joshua and expect that they're going to be exactly the same thing. You need, but you need to have that understanding so that you don't fall victim to that. Or read the book of Revelation and consider it to be you know, equivalent of um, the book of Matthew. All right? They're not going to be the same. So, number four, the rule of word definitions. This is the, when we're talking about historical, critical, grammatical. What does, what does a word mean? What did it mean then? How is it translated? What does it mean now? Now, ideally, a study of scripture, any interpretive study of scripture, will involve study of the words in the original languages. Greek, Hebrew, a little Aramaic in there. Um, but the fact is that there are so many tools in the Instituto, I consider, should we be, and I had somebody ask me uh, several terms ago, um, could we have classes in Biblical Greek, you know, Koine Greek for the New Testament, and Hebrew for the Old Testament? Well, I had several responses. One, I think that would probably kill part of you, <laughs> because that's not easy. You start getting into, you know, uh, Hebrew especially. Different language, goes in a different direction, no vowels, you know, the original, etc., etc. Um, but not only that, but it would take me an enormous amount of work to get back up to the point with my Greek and Hebrew that I could teach it. Please don't. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> it doesn't mean you have to take it. But, um, and the fact is that there are so many really good texts today that do a great job with that. And you can work with the Greek and Hebrew words using, um, like, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. And by the way, there is a new version of Strong's, not new, it's been around for years, um, to the NIV. You know, the original strongest concordance was the King James. And what that means is, you can look up any word, and it will tell you where it appears, and it will tell you what the subtle differences in meaning, and it will identify what the Greek or Hebrew word was. And all of the different Greek and Hebrew words that get translated as that. You know, just like the old saying about the Inuit Indians have you know, what, 22 words for snow, or whatever, I don't remember how many it is, it's a lot of them. Because for them, there's a whole lot of snow, and they need to differentiate that. Well, similarly, when you compare one language to another language, there's often multiple different words that get translated into one word in the new language. Well, the exhaustive concordances and other textual guides and, and uh, reference books will help you understand the subtle differences between those words that all get translated as snow or you know or whatever it is, sin or transgression. Or, and so there are tools that will help you understand that. If you're serious about doing biblical interpretation, you need to get into understanding what at least the key words in any particular passage mean, what they really mean, not just how they got translated in a particular text. The first level of that is comparing multiple translations. If you're serious about doing biblical interpretation, then you should plan on having three or four or five different translations of the Bible to see how those that particular major words, the important words in the text, get translated differently. And then be prepared to go back and look those up in something that would give you the subtleties of the original language, even if you don't read Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. Now, I do almost all of my study on the computer. I have a piece of software called PC Study Bible. PC Study Bible and Logo Software are the two companies that I believe are producing the best um, computer software now for Bible. But what that means is, PC Study Bible, I bring up a passage. And I have default for me is the, the NIV. I have, I think, 32 different translations. With the click of a button in, on the left-hand column, I can click the King James Bible and see how it reads in King James. I can click the New American Standard. Or any one, Dewey Reigns, you know, the Catholic Bible. Any one of a number of other translations, and I've got them right there. I can put them all on the screen at once and see the differences. There are built into the software textual guides that will allow me to look at the original Greek and Hebrew words if I want to. Both in English, you know, I mean English uh, versions like Strong's and others. So there are ways you can do this without spending $10,000 on a library. Um, 
it'll be a few hundred dollars to, to, to a well, but um, that's the easy, the, the best way to get at that right now. And I strongly recommend, if you're serious about understanding what scripture is and says, I would recommend that you have software in your computer. Right, Chris? Yeah. We had this back and forth about a little while about which version of the of the software we should get. So And there's the, the BibleGateway.com that's free that you can do what you just said. It can't, it, I'm sure it can't do all the stuff that PC Bible right. has. Yeah, there's free stuff online. BibleGateway.com is a good one where you can look at different, different all different translations um, and see what the different ones say, etc. Uh, and in other languages too. For instance, when we, for a long time, we were, um, I was doing the readings for services and I was doing them in English and in Spanish. And I left, I was getting ready to leave, and somebody said, well, I'll do that, but I don't have a typewriter that will type Spanish. And I said, I don't type Spanish. I go to Bible Gateway, and they've got it in Spanish, and I just copy it and paste it, you know? Chris? Yeah, I was going to say, there's, if you look up Blue Bible online, it'll, it gives you the, you know, you can find the Greek words, and it pronounces it, it shows you how it's used at work. Good. It's very easy. Blue Bible, okay? I've never heard of that, so that's good. Blue Bible. Um, original usage. What did it mean to the original writers? All of whom were Jews except for Luke. Um, you need to understand the original usage of the words as well as what they define. The biblical context. Every word is part of a verse. Every verse is part of a paragraph. Every paragraph part of a chapter. Every chapter part of a book. Every book part of the overall Bible. You need to read things in terms of the context. Reading things out of context has been the source of so many heresies. For instance, the Mormon Church says there are many gods. You know that the God we count as God was only one God. He became divine, brought his wife with him, and you know that there are going to be many gods. In fact, you will be a god if you're you know on the right camp. Um, well, they do that as a translation, a mistranslation of 1 Corinthians 8, 5b, the second half, which says, "For there be many gods and many, and those many." Now that proof text is used by them to define, to say there are many gods. Well, in fact, if you read the context, Paul is saying, is making a point of how that's wrong. Because remember, Paul addressed the Greek and Roman um, polytheisms. And he's not saying that's true, he's saying it's not true. And yet you take it out of context and it makes it sound like he's saying that that's a fact, that there are. So you need to understand the biblical context, you need to use the rule of logic, God is the originator of logic and rationality and common sense. We need to use those tools when we look at this stuff. If something simply doesn't make sense, it's not logical, it's not rational, then that's a pretty good sign that there's a problem with it. And the rule of inference. That means that there are some things that are not said plainly in Scripture, but that we can infer them or develop and you know that belief or state that belief based upon what is there. Uh, a beautiful example of that is the doctrine of the Trinity. The Bible never talks about the Trinity, but there are many places, and I'm going to be preaching on the Trinity this Sunday, so you can come listen. Um, it's you know Jesus said right before he departed, before the ascension, he said, "Go into all the lands and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit." There are other places where the Spirit is referred to. There are places where, you know... So, it is legitimate for us to infer from those number of places where it talks about these different parts of God, there are multiple gods, that there is a trinity of God. And so our doctrine of the trinity is based on that, and an inference from what the Bible does say. So here are eight sort of rules for finding the meaning in Scripture. Dependence on the Holy Spirit, historical context, genre judgment, word definitions, original usage, biblical context, logic, and inference. Those are legitimate approaches. Always with the understanding that Scripture is the best interpreter of itself, and there is nothing new under the sun. Okay? If you think you have found um, a meaning to a Scripture passage that nobody else has ever come up with, <laughs> you're almost certainly wrong. And I've had people come up to me and say, oh, I just figured out how Jesus was incarnate. You know, he just, you know, and this happened. God took me to get coffee one time. He'd been coming to my classes, and he said, oh, you know, Jesus was just a man, but then when he was, ba when he was baptized, and the, the dove descended on him, the Holy Spirit, then he became divine. And I just figured that out, and it's great. And I go, well, that's a very old heresy called adoptionism. And he was so upset with me. Because I had, you know, he thought he had found the truth that nobody else had ever found. 
Um, and I, but I poked a hole in his bubble and he was not happy with me. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, you're not going to find great truths that nobody else has found, but you will affirm for yourself the great truths that have always been there. Questions or comments? Terry? Well, I think there's a ninth one, perhaps, and, and it's called pastoral interpretation. Okay. <laughs> for me, your words, which I know are, are I believe, are divinely inspired, helps me interpret. And it's not really, it's kind of all of those, or parts of those, depending on the circumstance. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's why one of the reasons, not just the fellowship, but why I learned when I attend worship service. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I think that for a lot of these things, there are sources that will provide you with this. You know, we talk particularly about word definitions and things, that there are sources you can go to. Well, there are sources, that you, human sources you can go to, too. You know, lectures you can go to. Sermons you can hear, Bible studies you can attend, classes you can go to. Those are those are just a different kind of source. But thank you, I appreciate that. All right. Anything else? Focus on meaning. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it.